Thank you, Father. Lord, for you just your presence, for being here. God, I just thank you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. God, to come upon us. Lord, as just this mighty army raises up. In yes. Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, I just felt a real stirring in me recently for to go back and teach some things. Teaching, uh, reinforce, we talked about the prophetic last Thursday, Sunday, you ladies got released, right? Um, I want to talk about spiritual warfare, casting out demons. Boom. Cool. We're talking about how to cast out demons. And in some churches it's called casting out deacons. <laughs> so, um, my experience with this, not too long after I got saved, um, was with the Methodist Church, and we started going down to this revival tent down in the county. And uh, uh, the Lord told me that's where He would, I would begin to preach there, and that's where He would teach me. And I was as scared as she could be, probably as much as Leslie was when she got up here. And um, so I'm coming out of a nice little comfortable Methodist church, and I start preaching in this tent, and things like people throwing up in garbage cans started. Mm. And people would just fall out, you know, and roll around, and they were casting out demons, and I would look and i go, oh my gosh, we're not in Kansas anymore, totally. <laughs> And uh, so I kind of cut my teeth on it there. Um, went over, started going overseas, and ran into a lot of it overseas in India and in the Dominican Republic. Got a hold of a book by Carlos Anacondia, which helped me a whole lot. I remember I went into this one particular service. Um, Uh, that after I read his book, and he would get up, and uh, this guy was incredible. Uh, I'm just going to share about him a bit later. But uh, I just began to call out the evil spirits in this church and to cast them out. And all of a sudden, people just started falling and manifesting. Like, boom, 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 boom. Problem was, I hadn't told the pastor I was going to do. I didn't even know it would work. <laughs> Honestly, I was not prepared for this. I didn't know how. You know, maybe it works for other people, but it doesn't work for me. And uh, so I just started casting out demons over probably you know two, three hundred people, and people start dropping. I remember there was this one young boy, probably about ten, falls down and starts smashing his head against the concrete floor as hard as he can, just pounding his head and. Uh, People were falling out, and uh, sure. remember, the uh, pastoral team was like running everywhere. And afterwards, the pastor said, "Let me know before you do that." <laughs> like, didn't know it would work. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, I have seen um, um, the good, bad, and the ugly with it uh, in Brazil. Uh, I mean, I, I, where we go overseas, we taught churches. I taught churches how to do it, how to properly take people through deliverance that respects the person. Um, I was in this one meeting in Dominican Republic. Uh, there was this couple, a guy and his girlfriend, and the first time there, that's what they told me. And they're in their early 20s. And she falls down in front of me and starts doing the thing like the snake. Her tongue is coming out at me. And uh, so I think it was two or three of the guys from the pastoral team of that church jump on her. And grab her by the neck and start screaming at her. Screaming to cast a demon. Well, the boyfriend's freaking out. I mean, he comes to church with his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, three guys are on top of her. Get out of there, say no! <laughs> and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is not good. This guy's getting his fist. He's ready to thump with some people. I mean, you're messing with my girl. You know? Wow. And um, I was talking to Gary Oates in, in, in Brazil. They do that a lot. They have this thing about wanting to grab them, the people by the neck and choke them as they're screaming at the demon. And um it's, 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 it's crazy. 
Okay, but um, this is something that Jesus did often. And he told us often. There's uh, eight main verses, the Great Commission out of Mark 16. You know, it says, we're going to all the world and preach the gospel. These signs shall follow those that believe. The first sign is in my name they will cast Amen. out the demons. Amen. The very first sign. They will speak with new tongues. They will you know, pick up serpents. They will hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick. And they will recover. Number one was they will cast out demons. Um, in Luke 4, it said that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And he said, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. And to set at liberty to those that were oppressed. I mean, that's just that's the, the commission upon Jesus. Luke 10, 19, he turned to his disciples and said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Yes. How much power do you have over the enemy? All. All. Luke 9, 1, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Often you're going to find power to cure sickness and cast out demons is within the same sentence. Roughly about 25% of the miracles Jesus did had to do with casting out demons. Hmm. About 25%. Often that was the key to healing. As you cast the demon out and then the person got healed because the demonic spirit was what was keeping them sick. Uh, Matthew 10, 1, and he caused the 12 disciples to him, gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. The same thing. Matthew 10, 6, uh, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of God is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, yes. and cast out demons. As you go. 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the enemy. And that's what we're doing. We're going out and destroying the works of the enemy. Jesus, in every commission that he gave us, uh, he told us to cast out demons. And uh, Jesus did it often. It was a large part of his ministry. It's a large part of ours. And you run into them a lot more than you think. Not every demon's going to uh, do the thing in front of you like a snake. It doesn't always work that way. There's a difference between, you know, people always ask, can Christians have demons? The answer is yes. But there's a difference. There's possession and oppression. I do not believe a Christian can be possessed because possession signifies ownership. I possess this. It's mine. But Christians can be oppressed. Maybe some of you are oppressed. It's a demonic spirit. Uh, so in the sense of oppression, Christians can have demonic spirits. And I'm going to show you that more here soon. Um, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, I'm just going to read down the demonic spirits listed in the Bible. Okay? And I'm not going to read off all the verses, but each one comes out of a verse. I, I can give this to you later. Actually, I'm thinking of putting these notes on the website. Yeah. So it be good. There's a um, familiar spirit. Spirit of jealousy. An evil spirit. A sorrowful spirit. Lion spirit. Haughty spirit. Perverse spirit. Spirit of deep sleep. A spirit of heaviness. A spirit of whoredom. Unclean spirit. A deaf and dumb spirit. Spirit of infirmity. Spirit of <coughs> divination. Spirit of bondage. 
spirit of slumber, spirit of fear, spirit of lust, spirit of antichrist, spirit of error, a seducing spirit, a spirit of Egypt, which is also known as the spirit of the world, and a spirit of disobedience. Now these are the demonic spirits listed in the Bible. So when you ask the question, can a Christian have a demonic spirit? Absolutely. I know Christians walk around with spirits of fear. Spirits of heaviness. Spirits of depression. A lot of Christians deal with that, being oppressed by these spirits. Again, there's a difference between oppression and possession. Um, remember we went to India with Reinhard Bonnke's team. And we were in the great city of Vishakhapatnam. Right. Vishakhapatnam. Vizag is what they call it. And there was a temple, a Hindu temple, close to our hotel. And, uh, you know, they, they worshiped gods in these Hindu temples. And they were like uh, their own cults. And these guys wore black karate jumpsuits type things. And their god was the found this boy and they would drag this boy in there and worship this boy and they said he was the first offspring of two homosexual men and they would worship this boy um, when these guys got around you there was nobody home the, there was some, the, the most emptiness me and Steph commented on this there was such an emptiness in these guys eyes and you felt like they just wanted to jump on you and beat you. You just, you just felt so terrible when you got near them. They were possessed. Uh, so there's all different levels where the enemy can have control over people. Um, so in the 1980s, God uh, in Argentina God raised up a man named Carlos Anacondia. We got to meet him and, uh, at a conference up in St. Paul, Minneapolis. I've never been so impacted by a single individual as I have by Carlos. Carlos was an ordinary businessman. He owned a company that manufactured nuts and bolts. And he, would, uh, he just started preaching. He would go into a city and set up a tent. And he usually did it for three months. He felt, see, most times when you go out and do crusades, you do them for three or four days. Problem is, is, you don't break through always. So just when you get your breakthrough, you leave. And and what Carlos's was thing was, you got to stick it out. He says, I will not do a crusade for less than a month. Because, and the greatest miracles come at the end after you've broken through. Uh, Carlos, his first city that he went into was a city of 70,000 people they have 50,000 salvations in three months. Wow. His ministry rocked Argentina. Carlos had a heavy anointing for deliverance upon him. He would get up, he would preach a very simple gospel message. I mean, as simple as it gets. And then he would start this thing of, uh, Satan, listen to me. I command you to come out of these people. I command every chain to be broken. And he would start screaming at the crowd. And they had all these ushers, and people would start oh. dropping one after another, after another, after another. And these ushers, and they had a tent next to the crusade grounds. And the ushers would walk in, pick these people, just, you know, and carry them out into the tent, and they had people trained in the deliverance. Uh, over a hundred thousand people were delivered in these tents of manifesting demons. When we were at that conference, uh, that man dribbled me like a basketball. He messed me up. And when I, 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 I felt pretty good because when he got to that point in the service, when he started casting out demons, I remember I went right to the front. I said, God, I just want to get clean. It's going to be really embarrassing if this happens, but, you know, just, just go for it. And, and I stood up. I, I was okay. I felt pretty good about it. There's a, 
a story. I, I love this story about Brother Anacondia. He's such a humble guy, too. The most incredible humble guy. We went to out to eat, and uh, he insisted to take the back seat in the van because he was shorter than us. And this guy rocked Argentina. I'm like, oh, gosh. Humbleness, Lord. Uh, he was asked to speak at a conference, I believe it was in Switzerland or Sweden, and it was the Pentecostal Convention of that nation. So it was full of Pentecostal pastors. And he gets up there, and they're expecting a sermon from him. He starts screaming in tongues for 20 minutes. <laughs> he just starts shouting in tongues to this group of Pentecostal pastors. And they're looking at him, they start to get mad. Uh -huh. Think about me getting up here to do, to do that, right? They start to get mad, but after 20 minutes, they started dropping and manifesting demons. They were hauling pastors out of there, right? <laughs> so I just love the boldness. <laughs> so the reason I'm bringing him up is um, a man that worked with Carlos was named Pablo Pateri. Pablo Pateri. Pablo was in charge of the tent, the, the deliverance tent. He personally oversaw over 100,000 deliverances of people. And he's probably the most experienced person in the world. And he wrote a book on how to, uh, to set people free. He has a model, it's a 10 step model on how to set people free, and I've used that. Uh, most, most of ministries, Randy Clark, Bethel, they, they go back to Pablo's steps, on, and that's how they teach how to set people free for deliverance. So that's what we're going to go through, okay? Uh, the number one thing to remember is when, and let's just go to the point, there, as I said, there's different steps, there's different levels of manifestation, but let's just say a person begins to a manifest. Eyes roll back, falls down, does whatever. You could be praying for someone and this will happen. Often, at least it was with me, I was wanting to instantly go after the demon because it stirs something up in you. And you just want to rush in and cast it out. Wrong. Totally, totally wrong. Uh, oftentimes, demons will manifest to get attention. Remember one time we were in the Dominican Republic. Uh, we did street evangelism during the day. And then we would go out and invite people to the crusade that night. So I was teaching the team on street evangelism, on, you know, on how to pray for the sick, how to give words of knowledge and things like that. So we had like 80 people that were getting ready to split up in groups of two and go out onto the streets. And just when we were getting ready to split up, this one girl be, begins to manifest and makes this big scene. Why did the devil wait till then? When we were just getting ready to split up. And so we start to pray for this person and you have 80 people stop to watch. And that was the purpose. You do not give the enemy the place. You do not let the enemy pull everyone's attention to what the devil is doing. Your priority when you minister deliverance to a person, it's to the person, not to the demon. The person is always the priority. They are individual that's having spiritual problems. It's the love you show that person. Not the anger you feel at what's happening. The, um, you know, I was, I was thinking about it today, one of the worst mistakes that I made, um, I was at a teen, um, a teen challenge. And there was like 50 some guys there. You know, when, when you minister at this place, it, it was really hard because these guys were broken. So you have 50 lives that the devil has just shattered. And in their ministry, and I'm going one to another to pray for these guys, because I preached and I was praying for them. I remember I got to this one guy, and all of a sudden I went into this open vision. 
And the Lord showed me the sexual sin that he was involved in. And he also, I saw a scene of him sexually molesting a young child. And I instantly got mad. Now this guy is not manifesting at all. He's just standing there, but God's downloading this stuff to me. The scene of him molesting a child got me so mad. I just turned and said, You foul, ugly spirit, come out of there! <laughs> like that. And the guy just went from normal to wow and hit the floor and started flopping around. That was the wrong thing to do. And, uh, it, you know, it just, and I look back and it taught me so much. Okay? The priority is the person, not the demon. The key is not wrestling, but the key is authority. The demonic spirit is in that person or oppressing that person because that person has given that spirit authority. So when you start out, you've got it. The key is to take the authority away from the spirit. Uh, authority is given. Doors are open. The enemy has entry points and entry doors into that person's life. The key to a proper deliverance of that person is to find the entry doors and shut them. When you shut the doors, the spirit's authority is taken away and the deliverance is easy. Because he has no right to be there. Um, the person doesn't have to throw up. They don't have to flop. You want to get the person calm as quickly as you can. The, 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 the two things that you ever need to say to the demonic spirit would be number one, to shut up, and at the end, to go. That's the only conversation that you're going to have. You know, it's, it's funny. I remember I walked up on this one guy, and he was, there was this person manifest on the floor, and he was doing his thing. All right, devil, what's your name? Tell me your name. Tell me your name. I went, he's not going to tell you, he's a liar. He's not going to tell you, he's that. And if he, John, what, John Doe. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's, he's a lion. Why ask him a question? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. You do not need to be a militant. You do not need to holler. You need to love. Mm. The love you show that person, they're the priority. They're who you're ministering to. Forget about what's going on. Minister to the person. Be firm, but love. Okay? Be encouraging to the person. Raise hope in the person. You have to remember, maybe this person has been in bondage for years. And maybe other people have prayed for him unsuccessfully. But what you're going to do is you're going to do it differently. And it's going to be effective when you do it. Okay. If the spirit begins to manifest, and whatever, I mean, the eyes are rolling back, you know, whatever. The spirit's manifesting. Get them to stop. Do not let the spirit manifest. I usually go up and I go, Shalom, peace, peace, Shalom, Shalom. If it's okay, peace, peace. And you can tell the spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to be quiet. I command you to stop it. Because you want to deal with a person. You don't want to deal with the spirit. So you can repeat that until it stops, until the manifestation stop, stops. And don't be, if, if it doesn't happen first or second, just keep at it. Amen. Shalom, shal peace, peace, brother, peace, peace, peace. And just let the person calm down. Don't touch the person. Try not to touch the person. There is an anointing upon you. It's a fire upon you. It will torment the, that evil spirit. We are not out to make a show. We're not out to torment the devil. We don't want the devil to manifest. 
we want him to be quiet so we can talk and minister to the person. There, I, I, I noticed there, were, there was a fire in my hands, and when I would touch the person, they would like this. I'm like, whoa. At, at first, you think, oh, I got some power. But, it's, but you don't want to do that. We're not trying to stir up, up the spirit that's there, okay? Get the person to calm down, and then establish contact, eye contact, and communication with the person that, that, that you're going to pray for. So you get the devil to be quiet. The person's eyes may be shut. Get them to open their eyes and look at you eye to eye. Tell them it's going to be okay. Um, try to encourage them. You may say something. Uh, if, if, if they drop their head, if they're closing their eyes, stay at it until their eyes are open looking at you. Yeah. Because you're, what's the main priority? Is the person that you're getting ready to pray for. Sure. You got to talk to them, not the spirit. So the first thing you do is ask the person if they want to get set free. See, this is the problem when you just go up because you someone starts to manifest the devil and you just want to jump up and cast it out, that person may not want to get set free. Mm -hmm. I've had people tell me no. Me I go, okay, have a great day. I am done. <laughs> if to set this person free, they got to want to be set free. Because mm -hmm. you know what happens when the house is empty. <coughs> it's seven times worse. An evil spirit will come back. So you may have the anointing to cast that demon out, don't use it unless the person wants you to use it. So you get the person calm. Get the devil to be quiet. Ask the person do they want to get set free. If they say no, just talk them through it. Get them to understand. what Maybe they don't understand what you're trying to do. But, you know, talk to them. This is a conversation time. If the uh, if that devil starts to rear his head back again, you just command him to be quiet in Jesus' name. Shut up and be still. And say, I want to talk to Joe, or I want to talk to Sally. And you keep bringing that person back, maintaining eye contact. If at any time the person wants to leave, let them leave. Don't hold them down. Um, do not minister to the person uh, against their will. They've got to want this. Most do. But they, they have to want this. Okay, so you ask the person, do you want to get set free? And let's just say the person says yes. Then the next thing to do is to get the person saved, to get them to give their life to Jesus. Would you like to surrender your life to Jesus right now and get set free? Lead them in a sinner's prayer. Now, you've got the devil. Calm down. You're talking to the person. They have a desire to get set free. Now you're going to get them to surrender their lives so they can begin to close the doors that's been opened to the enemy. Um, it's important that the person accepts Jesus Christ as a personal Savior because they're going to need the Holy Spirit to stay free. Mm -hmm. If they do not want to accept Jesus as a personal Savior, stop. Just, you know, pray for them. Just bless them. Lord, I just pray that you heal them. In Jesus' name, God bless. And then get up and stop. Because you will not be able to fill them with the Holy Spirit, which is the last step. We want the house to be full when we're done. Matthew 12, 43 says, When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it will go through uh, dry places seeking rest and not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house that I left. When it arrives, if it finds a house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order that's cast it out swept clean put in order 
but empty? There it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there, and the final condition of that man is worse than the first. So you, so you don't want to make the person's life worse. Okay? So the person wants to get set free. He accepts Jesus Christ now as his personal Savior. The next thing to do is begin to interview the person. Because you've got their attention. It's eye-to-eye -eye contact. You're loving on the person. Um, ask them about, try to find out what parts of their life led to this bondage. Interview them. The, you're going to be surprised how the word of knowledge will kick in. It's kind of like Sozo. You do Sozo, that word of knowledge just gets activated. And the God will show you and lead you into the questions to ask them. You can usually begin with, with, their, with their mom and dad and, and their parents. Which, you know, if, if you don't know, just start there. What was your relationship with your parents? You know, was your dad at home? Is, is there unforgiveness? You know, you just kind of start with that because all that stuff can open up doors. Uh, don't rush through this. Take time. You're ministering to the person. They're your main priority. Love on them. Uh, during this time, never do anything to, to cause that demon to get stirred up. We're not talking to him. We're ministering to the person. Fear is a main entry point for people. People can, Christians, can live in fear. The, the fear will open doors for demonic oppression. And uh, as you're asking questions, find out where the fear is at. You know, what caused the fear? Get back to the root of it. Uh, and then the next thing to do is to lead the person in prayers to close the doors. It's, uh, unforgiveness is huge. You know, most people have some form of unforgiveness somehow, whether it's parents or themselves. They can be mad at God. But there's all, all kinds of things there. Um, so ask them, ask them to repent, have them say it out loud, to repent of unforgiveness, the things the Lord shows you, have them renounce it. Let's just say someone's in the occult. Okay? They need to renounce the occult. And when a person renounces something, they're not speaking to God, they're speak, speaking to the enemy. I renounce that stuff I was involved in. If it's sexual sin, I renounce it. it. It breaks. When that person gets saved and they renounce it, it breaks the stronghold over their life. Uh, it needs to be audible and it needs to be firm. Not any time there is process do you have to holler. Okay? Um, It can be sometimes no fault of the person. It can be something that they witnessed. Uh, it could be fear, maybe there was a bad accident, and the trauma and the fear that came out of that accident. That can open up doors. It could be um, they saw their parents fight often. That opened up doors. And you're gonna try to find the roots of what opened the doors. That's the whole purpose in this. Packs with Satan, you get all that to be renounced. After the person renounces it, you as a person praying over them, you break the yoke. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of fear over your life. and cast it out. I break the power of fear. Um, once you've got all those doors closed, now, remember I said in the beginning, an evil spirit is there because that person gave them authority to be there. Once the authority is taken away, 
that's why when you see sometimes when people are screaming and hollering and man the devil leave, they've never taken the devil's authority away. So it's hard. Once you take the devil's authority away to be there, you can just say, now, devil, in the name of Jesus, go. And it's that easy. It's not, it's easy. And, and you just feel the whoosh come off of them. So powerful. The, the evil spirit will leave quickly and it will leave quietly at that point. Uh, if, you, if you do that and the evil spirit has not left, you go back to the previous step of going back in the, okay, there has to be some more doors open. And you keep ministering to the person until you feel the release. You can feel the release in your spirit. You know, it's funny. Overseas, the demons are right in your face. It's like they try, try to scare you. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., they try to think, make you think that you don't exist. Mm -hmm. Completely different tactic. So, um, sometimes there's more than one. And I, I call it, this is just my words for it, but often I'll cast out a demon and the other one, he'll just, he'll get flat, he'll flatten out. It's like hiding, mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, just put my hand and I'll say, Lord, you can, you can kind of tell in your spirit, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Put your hand on, God, is there any more? And uh, um, the Lord will let you know. You know, sometimes when me and Steph will come back and, and she'll say, it's a person set free, I go, no. no she goes, yeah, I didn't think so either, but we usually know. And, you know, you can't sometimes, there's restraints on time because you're actually getting in, into counseling during that part. There's an inner healing part of it. You know, what was so cool, when I went to that church one time and I read Pablo Batari's book and Carl Sanacani's book, I go to that church, and I just bust loose on the same technique and all these people start dropping everywhere. And the pastor says, oh my gosh, you gotta let me know. I went back to the same church a couple years later, did the same thing, and hardly maybe one person manifested. And I thought there was something, man, did I, did I lose it? You know, lose the anointing? What's going on? And I asked the pastor, I said, I was surprised. He was, oh, man, we do sozo now. <laughs> there you go. Wow. He said, yeah, uh, one of the when a person comes to their church, they have this in first thing they do is this encounter weekend. And and, and he says, Oh yeah, we, we get all that stuff taken care of now. We don't want any more of that stuff in here that you can start off. <laughs> that's, that, that's the power of inner, inner healing, the power of Sozo. <laughs> Sets you free. So part of this process is doing the inner healing the counseling, finding the open doors, renouncing, get the person to, to renounce that, and then shutting the doors, and the devil has to leave because he has no authority to stay. has no authority. Uh, so you cast out the devil. Next thing you do is lead the person in a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Thank God for what's just, you know, Lord, I just thank you, God setting me free. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. And then the, the last step is to, ask, is to lead the person to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filling, fill every part of that person, every cavity, every hole, just fill them with the Holy Spirit. Sure. And uh, it's amazing to see the countenance on people's faces change. It's just... Uh, you know, to see a person bound up and to see him get set free after that, it's just, it's just amazing. It really is. Some of the, some of the spirits, spirits that um, people walk in, like the spirit of heaviness, spirit of fear, and, and, and uh, spirit of depression, and things like that, they, they don't come in as much by sin as they come in by agreement. 
So the enemy comes to you and says, you're not as good as that person. Go, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Bam, doors open. Mm -hmm. wow. Or you, you haven't read your Bible enough, you're not smart enough, you're this, you're that. Yeah, that's right. Bam, doors open. Mm -hmm. And what people do that suffer from this is there's a pattern in their life that, and it's not outward sin, it's just the pattern of coming into agreement with the lie. Right. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the enemy comes to lie. And he has no power. All of the enemy's power has been stripped unless you empower him. And you empower him by agreeing with him. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So let me, for people that deal with that, let me give you some suggestions to help break that pattern. It's difficult because it's a pattern that you've developed in your mind. It could be low self-esteem, uh, you know, whatever that you deal with inside that you keep agreeing with the enemy that you're not good enough or you don't measure up. You're always going to be poor. Uh, you're never going to have enough money. You're never going to do as good as someone else does. You know, these are the thoughts come in, the lies, you agree with them, and the doors open. All right. Uh, first of all, to understand that you're in a pattern is important. And it's a demonic pattern. And the, the devil's not smart, but he's persistent. He finds out what, what works and presses the button constantly. Mm -hmm. Bam, 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 bam. All right. Um, it's not only to read the Bible, but fill yourself with praise. Constantly praise. And yes. when you're breaking a pattern, you have to almost go overboard. Mm -hmm. You have to make room to go the other way. So you constantly praise and constantly singing. You're praying in tongues almost constantly. You just whatever you're doing on the inside, you're just you know, you're just praying. You're 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 pushing harder. You're disciplining yourself to stay in the sp spirit more than you usually do. You're going over and above. Whenever the thoughts come, recognize the thought as it comes. It's a temptation. and Take authority over it right then. Learn to not agree, but to learn to take authority over the thoughts. No, I am as good as anyone else. I cast that out now in Jesus' name. I rebuke that thought in Jesus' name. And then constantly, verbally, thank God for setting you free. If you're struggling with bondage, speak things as though they are that they're not, you know. So thank God for setting you free. Or just thank you that I'm free from depression. I thank you, God, that I'm free from fear. Just thank you that I'm free from heaviness, Lord. God, just, just, you just keep at it all day long. God, I just thank you that you're setting me free. I just worship. I just thank you that you're setting me free. And you're, you're really going at it with the opposite spirit. If you fall in, in whatever you're struggling with, if you succumb to it, don't let shame stop, but get up quickly and go back to what you did before. Lord, just thank you for setting me free. Don't let shame come in and stop. Okay? And ask, wake up every morning, not just to read your Bible, but ask to be filled with the Spirit of God. Lord, fill me. Lord, just fill me. It's just, you've really got to go at this to break a cycle within your mind. You know, it says uh, to break habits, it takes an average of nine months to break a habit. So, you know, if you've had a habit for years of agreeing with a lie, know that it's, you know, you've got to break that. Yes. But you can. It will change your life.
Amen. I'll hold it. It's being recorded. Um, the people that are oppressed, Christians that are oppressed, um, do they manifest in the same way as being? No. Okay. Well, what's an example of someone being oppressed? Is it just the signs of like depression or fear, depression, fear. heaviness? Um, so it's it's so they don't really man they don't manifest in yeah like it's snake like way. It's usually they're, not. they're walking in depression. They're walking in. Yeah. Bondage. They're walking in fear. Now, I'm not saying every single depression is from a demon because there's because there are the chemical things in the brain. Yeah. Too. Uh, and you know, but I think it, a whole bunch is. I think you know, we're spiritual warfare. I've always said it. Yeah. Spiritual warfare that either you're a victim or you are a target, but you're in spiritual warfare. Yeah. Get used to it. Yeah, we're spiritual beings. Yeah. So uh, I'd rather be a target than a victim. Amen. Um, being a mom of four kids, I am wondering if young children, before they actually step into agreement of inviting Jesus into their heart for real, can they be possessed, or is that oppression? Can you can you approach it the same way with a child when it comes to disobedience, rebellion, um, things of that nature? Because I was thinking about going home and, and doing that. <laughs> 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 parents have been cast out of the spirit of disobedience on the children, right? Well, the reason that I say that is because I was in the car one time and my three-year-old son, he just was adamant. I mean, I kept having to pull over the car and finally I had had enough and I actually parked the car, I crawled over the seats and instead of doing what I normally would do, I calmly spoke to the spirit of rebellion I told him to go Wow and immediately his countenance changed he's, and he from that point on he was fine so that's why I asked I think praying the spirit of peace over him all the time and, and love just constantly verbally speaking that can help a whole lot mm -hmm. uh, I don't know for sure to be honest okay. about that um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> because I'm going to go through the process with them, even if, you know, just to be sure. But I do want to give them an opportunity to ask Jesus in their heart and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that way, anything that is cast out, you know. I believe, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about it. If um, a child experiences separation or maybe a trauma, Certainly, insecurities and fears can come in. Yeah. You really have to be careful what you allow in your homes with yeah. the kids because if you watch um, some of these cartoons and some of these children's shows are not good for kids, and so that can open a door right in your home. So you really have to be careful what you allow in the home. So the eye gate. I have two questions. Um, uh, you said something about sometimes you can't get all the demons out because of time constraints and other uh, things. So if, if there's time constraints, would you want to cast, cast them out at all? Because if you cast some out and then there's, you know, maybe more demons would come in. I always don't know going into it. I mean, you know, if you're in a church or in ministry situation, don't know how deep it is sometimes until you get into it. And then you get into it and realize this is going to take counseling. So, uh, you know, we've uh, I've been at different churches where I spoke, gone to the pastor afterwards and said, look, uh, you really need to get up with such and such a person and talk to them. I've been in church situations where the person will begin to, you know, just to outwardly manifest the demon. I got the demon to be quiet, shut the demon up, and then I walked away and told the pastor, because I, I, I know he's after attention, and, I, and I, I'm not going to stop a service of 100 people you know, when the pastor has a team that can take that person to the side and help them. So I, you don't always know, but it's, it's a good point. And the other question is, um, you mentioned you don't touch the, the person. I try not to, yeah. But um, then you were saying that um, 
you know, like if one demon is cast out and you didn't feel like they were all out, that you would, um, it sounded like you were saying you would touch them and explore, is there anything else? Yeah, uh, well see, I didn't, there's times you don't touch them because the fire on you, you don't, you don't want to get the demon worked up. Right. But if I'm not sure if there's anything left, then I'll put my hands and try to get whatever's left worked up so I know there's still something there or not. And if I touch him again, then I then I know I'm not done. I take my hand off and I go back to you know to ministry. There's a question online um, about somebody's will, their free will being yep. affected by demons if they open up the doors. Are they? Is their free will actually impacted? The, if, if the person has opened a door through agreement or through sin, so they are the ones that are opening the door. Um, and then when you start to go through the process, do you want to get set free? I mean, their will's coming into play there. Uh, if the person's keeping doors shut in their life, the devil has no authority. Again, it's only what we give them. Um, this has to do with Christians. You know, when you minister and you're around people and stuff, you see things. And you did hit on depression and a couple of things, but there's a couple of areas. It's like addiction. Like uh, there are Christians who are in addictions, like sexual, drug, whatever. Again, they're trying to overcome. How I like to go there, and also there are people who. And I'm not talking like you know we have our off days and days, but you know. There are people that we walk with that there are some days they're just as good as good, and other days they are just like, you think they're possessed. You know, they have that, you know, that, that up and down, and they're not bipolar. I mean, they are not, but it's just, they said that's just the way they are. You know, we all know people like that. And I just want to ask you, is, you know, I, I know it's a tough question, sorry, but I just want to ask, you know, and, and if you feel like they are oppressed, you know, how, how do you go about something like that? I'm just going to put it out there. If um, You're going to have to be able to ask the person to get to the question, do you want to get set free? Mm -hmm. So whatever the conversation encompasses, I mean, it may be sharing Jesus with them. You know, maybe talking about their issues. If they're open to talk about, if they're not open, they're just nothing. I mean, if they're Christian, they claim they're Christian. They're walking the Christian life yeah. supposedly, but there's like it's like one day they're in victory, the next day they're in defeat or type thing. You know, they're just like that, and it just it, yeah. their life just sway and like the, the you know to and fro. Yeah, um, you've got to get to the point where they can discuss it, and it's it's, it's the counseling part of the kick so. mm -hmm. That's why we're you know, really big, the, the SOZO, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we really train people on inner healing. Uh, I mean, Susan's been through a lot of it. And different, it's so helpful in this. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's critical. Mm -hmm. It just helps you cut through the stuff and get right to the root. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, That's it's more like a counseling type thing rather than a... <laughs> I mean, yeah, and sometimes you, you can also spot too, like if a person has constant migraines, it can be a spirit of depression sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. If they have constant neck pains, it can be depression. Sometimes, I mean, there's also physical stuff, so you can't have set answers, but I've, mm -hmm. this is just from what I've seen. I have another one. Okay. And it's, um, I guess it goes with the, um, the counseling part of the gift of discerning of spirits. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes um, I can see spirits on people, mm -hmm. and then sometimes I can see them in them. Mm -hmm. Would that be um, an example of oppression and, and possession? Could be, yeah. Okay, what happens if it's a Christian that I see it in them? Or is that just, is that just part of the discerning of spirits? You know, um, I think God speaks to us in different ways, right? So, again, that's asking Him, Lord, what does this mean in the way He's speaking with you, too? You know, just like when we prophesy, we may prophesy the same thing, but have two different visions, but they mean the same thing. So, 
that question is best to ask the Lord, God, mm -hmm. I see an enemy, what does that mean? That's right. And then just keep pressing through, and you'll start operating more deeper in well, the word of knowledge to find exactly what's going on. Well, I mean, that does happen. You know, I mean, it's not, it's um, not something that, um, you know, people can carry on, that the, the Lord doesn't show me. You yeah. Know, I mean, he only opens my eyes when he wants to. But, um, I don't know when you were just talking about the obsession and oppression. I know those, but then that just happens to me sometimes. I can yeah. literally see it in their eyes, but then... Yes, my pers it says my personal opinion that Christians are not possessed. Well, I believe that. I believe that, too. Uh, Bob Jones gave me a really good technique. Um, you asked the Lord to give you the uh, ability to see this, but you look into a person's eyes and are they clear or are they, are they cloudy? Spiritually. And uh, so Bob told me about this and I remember I was in a Walmart and I saw a friend I hadn't seen in a while and, I, and Bob had just told me this a couple days before and I looked in her eyes and her eyes were cloudy. And so Bob said, so when their eyes are cloudy, he goes, what that means is the demon's sitting on their shoulder whispering junk into their ear. You just got to knock it off. Nice. <laughs> so, all right. So I'm in Walmart, and I'm talking to this girl that I hadn't seen for a while, and her eyes are cloudy. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I just was, I, I said, you know your eyes are cloudy? It means there's a demon on your shoulder. You want me to knock it off? <laughs> she goes, okay. Wow. Now, get off her now when I did that. She, boom. <laughs> Set her free. So, guys, that's a technique. Look into their eyes. Ask the Lord, God, give me the ability. Here, let me just impart that to you right now. Lord, I just pray for the ability of each person to see if a person's eyes are cloudy or clear. Lord, and just release the anointing to break off the bondage over that person's life, to brush that just demon off their shoulder that's yes. speaking lies into that person yes. in Jesus' name. That's the thought is not the sin. That's good. That's right. The what thought is the temptation. Yeah, that's right. Now, I've heard people say, oh, I think such awful things. No I go, well, that's you're tempted with awful things. Right. What you do with them is the sin. So don't feel condemned with the thoughts. Right. Rebuke them and go on. And it can be a battle, a lot, you know, for people. It can be a battle. Thoughts will keep coming yeah. at them. And they think, oh, well, I'll do this three or four times. But sometimes it might take, like you were saying, the 90 days or nine months. Nine months, yeah. Um, to win that battle. Yeah, and if you fall, don't let shame. Yeah. Do not let shame keep yeah. you down. You're right back up. The person has to want to be, gets this, this, be set free. And oftentimes you just know when you're not able to do anything. And that's the, some of the tough things about dealing with the gift of discerning the spirits. Mm -hmm. Because you see a lot of things yes. that you're not doing anything about. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have the opportunity. You, you just see. And then you learn how to operate in the gift effectively as you grow in it. Yeah. Remember Jonathan Welton who wrote a book about the seer. He was talking about how he saw so much stuff that drove, drove him nuts at first. Yep. You know, you just walk through the mall. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like, oh my gosh, how do I deal with this? <laughs> oh, yeah. That was just in a women's shoe department. <laughs> the main thing is, is that you're ministering to the person. And the last thing you want to do is to make a big scene in front of a church where you embarrass the person. Uh, it's done with love. Yeah. Or at least to get that devil to shut up quickly and minister to the person with love. Get the door shut and then he has to come out. It's so easy. Get him saved, get him filled. Holy Spirit. Good stuff. We went up to house of prayer recently men's rehab. I mean they do a great job up there, but I I went into that, you know. Devil listen to me, I command you come out of every person in here right now and just, just kicked into that and it was only 
one person that, that I, I could see start to act up. And when I went out and prayed for him, he went down and started to you know, twist and turn and, you know, got him set free. So it, it happens here. Let's just raise our hands. Jesus, I thank you for setting me free. I'm going to say yeah. it. Jesus, thank you for setting me free. Thank you for freedom, Lord. Thank you for freedom. I renounce all doors of fear. I renounce all doors of fear. All doors that opened up to depression. All doors of depression. Shut up. Renounce them, Lord. Renounce it. Lord, show, I ask the Lord right now to show in your heart any areas of unforgiveness. Have Him just show you this. Ask Him. Unforgiveness in my heart, Lord. And then just forgive that person. Show. Just release it. Un unforgiveness. Just release it. Lord, you owe me nothing. I forgive you. You owe me nothing. I just want to declare over each of you right now that all doors have been shut in these areas. Now, Satan, you listen to me. I command you to let go of these people now in the areas of depression, unforgiveness, heaviness. I command demonic spirits to let go and leave now. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for freedom. I, and watching online, I just command that demonic spirit to leave now. In Jesus' name. Lord, let the spirit of freedom come in here. Oh. Wow. <laughs> let joy, the oil of joy, be released. The oil of joy be released now. Cool. any issues I have with my father, I ask you to bring it up to my mind now. Jesus, thank you. I want you to repeat after me. My father was not perfect. He made mistakes. I forgive you, Daddy. You owe me nothing. I release all unforgiveness. I release all unforgiveness. My mother was not perfect. My mother was not perfect. She made mistakes. She made mistakes. I forgive you. I forgive you. You owe me nothing. You owe me nothing. Thank you, Lord. I shut every door that was open through unforgiveness. Now, Satan, I command you to let them go in this area. Thank you, Lord. Thank 
know. Glory. Thank you, Lord. And fill up Holy Spirit. I think we have scheduled an encounter weekend coming up. What is that, Ryan? It's in, don't know the exact weekend. It's June. We have an encounter weekend coming up in June. It's going to be a Friday and a Saturday. We're going to use a lot of material for restoring the foundations. It's like a Friday night, and most of the day Saturday. It's intense. But, uh, uh, and you'll we'll get set free. Frank, Frank, it's really awesome. It's, it's incredible. We had one last September, right? That was, this is going to be, that was a Sozo one. This is RTF. This is like Sozo on double turbo. This is, it's intense. Steroids. I mean, it really gets into issues. It's something. Uh, it was the toughest thing I ever went through and the most freeing thing I've ever went Amen. through. When I went through that. So, uh, amen. Lord, we just thank you for tonight. Lord, I just, what an incredible opportunity, Father, just to minister freedom, to minister tools and techniques to set people free. Thank you. Lord, I should lock this in the hearts of minds of people. God, let this be used. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.